Amen. Well, God is good. All the time. Amen. Just want to reiterate that I am looking for some people to help out with the Sunday morning cafe. Um, that would uh, relieve some of my running around on Sunday morning. So if you are willing to be a part of a team of two and take a turn on a Sunday morning just to come in 9 o'clock and get the coffee going and set it up ready for 9.30 and then um, after the service uh, clean it up and then that person also would be at 10.20, you know, it's time to come in folks. Be kind of the, the gatekeeper at the door. And uh, that would be much appreciated if I could get just a couple of teams that are willing to do that. That would be awesome. Well, we're going to take some time and do a, a bit of a mini series on the book of Revelation. Why are we doing a series on the book of Revelation? Well, if we were in a church situation where we really needed to have um, some, some peace somehow in our, in our congregation, what would we study? What kind of messages would we bring? Hmm? If we needed peace, what would we study? Psalms or verses that give uh, hope that God is our peace, right? He is our peace. If we were to um, need to find hope, things were hopeless in our congregation, what would we study? Hope. Anybody know a good verse for hope? Oh my. <laughs> All right, Anne, thank you. If we were looking to embark on an evangelistic mission, what would we study? Evangelizing or maybe the Great Commission? Okay, what about um, we needed to do something on spiritual warfare? What would we study? Hmm? First Corinthians? Okay, the armor of God. Okay, what about love? What's the love chapter? Okay, we'd study love. We have been embarking on a year of looking to receive greater revelation. And so what are we going to study? Where we can find revelation. And so that the book of Revelation is a great place to find a revelation of the soon and coming king named Jesus. And there's so many other scriptures that are prophetic and revelatory in the Bible that we can take reference from, and I, I hope to show you how a lot of the books are situated right in the book of Revelation and how it's all uh, combined together. But this has been a year of asking God for revelation, and so we want to study revelations. Um, and it's, it's an apocalyptic vision of the end, but it still merits some study because, well, we believe that we are living quite near the end. And so we need to glean from Scripture in order to bring some increase to what are we facing? What's coming in the next possible few years? We don't have a specific timeline on anything that's going to happen, but we know it's coming. Amen? We know it's coming because the Bible says so. Uh, there's a minefield of references in the book of Daniel and Ezekiel, especially, that are interconnected with the book of Revelation. Um, but often we find that the prophetic stuff is neglected and for one main reason is because sometimes they can be pretty hard to understand the vision and the imagery it's pretty hard to understand and grasp that in our modern day because we don't talk like that and and so we need to kind of dive in a little bit and see how those symbolic visions and imagery how does it fit into the end times um, and so I want to embark on a journey over the next few weeks to explore just even the first four chapters of the book of Revelation. We could take, you know, a year, two years to get through the whole book if we really wanted to. But I just want to focus on the first four chapters. 
And what I'm doing is I'm hoping to build a foundation. I'm hoping to tickle your interest a little bit so that perhaps um, the a group of you, um, however many, if, if you're interested in continuing a study, continuing to learn about the, the imagery and symbolism and what it all means for today, then we can kind of make a small group study out of it to finish the remainder of the book outside of Sunday morning. But the first four chapters will give us a good foundation from which to understand at least um, the rest of the book. Now, I know the book of Revelation, it has confounded the best of biblical scholars. And so I'm not claiming whatsoever to have a corner on the market of knowledge in this. But what I'm sharing with you is what I have studied, what the Holy Spirit's revealed to me, what I have gleaned from my many resources that I have been uh, studying from and looking through. And um, so that, that, that's what I want to share with you this morning. So let's pray for Revelation, shall we? Father, I just pray that you would help us as we begin this study of Revelations, God, that you would lead us through it, that uh, we would not put our, our own emphasis or our own uh, insight into it, but that, God, you would give us your insight, and that you would open up our hearts and our minds, God, for a greater revelation of who Jesus is. In your name we pray. Amen. And so we're going to begin with just the first three verses of chapter 1. It says this, this is a revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the events that must soon take place. He sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant, John, who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is his report of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church, and he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says, for the time is near. There's lots in just those three verses. The writer is John, one of the 12 apostles who at that time was exiled on the island of Patmos because of his faith. There was a lot of persecution going on at that time. And so he likely wrote Revelation during the rule of the Roman emperor Domitian, which was in AD 81 to 96. At that time, Rome's military victories had brought a lot of enormous wealth to Rome and brought a lot of power, brought a lot of influence, but John is calling the church to see through the veneer of worldly success um, to the corrupt empire that was there underneath. One of the most graphic demonstrations of Rome's corruption was the spread of state-sanctioned cults of deities, of the empire and its tolerance of cults to the empire. And so they were demanding that that the whole society that they were in rule of, all of Rome, that they were mandated to accept and bow down to the deities that they called God. In AD 64, 65, which is about 30 years prior, uh, Emperor Nero uh, tortured and cruci crucified the Christians that were in Rome. They were singled out as scapegoats deemed by some as both antisocial or um, atheistic because they refused to honor the gods of the Roman state. So they were called atheists. Toward the end of the century, Domitian began to exhibit tendencies that led John to believe that he was becoming like a second Nero. It was happening again. They were killing Christians for sport. The initial audience that John was writing to that received the book of Revelation was a group of seven local churches in Southwest Asia Minor. Some of those congregations were experiencing persecution. Some were going through other doctrinal difficulties and practical problems that they were dealing with. But we can't forget that behind the surface of all of those things that there's a backdrop of unseen but powerful spiritual warfare going on. There was a lot of spiritual warfare. The enemy was really at work. This spiritual warfare is between two kingdoms, light and dark, good and evil, God and Satan. And this same spiritual warfare is going to be exhibited in the last days in exponential ways, leading up to Christ's return. 
But we have to keep in mind that those two kingdoms, they're not equal, are they? They're not equal. There's only one which is going to triumph in this battle. And we know which one that is. That is the kingdom of God. The battle is going to be intense. The battle is going to call us to take a stand. The battle is going to call us to make a decision who we're standing for and which kingdom that we're going to serve. Now, it's easy to forget that because of the contents that is written in the book of Revelation, that it was written to real people in real time who had real life issues. We kind of forget that sometimes. John was writing this down and taking it to the churches, and it was to give them hope that, you know what, God knows that you're going through all this stuff, but there is hope for the future. So be encouraged, churches. Be encouraged that God has not forgotten you. And the people, they would have been familiar with all of the symbolism that he used. They would have been able to understand it a lot better than we can understand it. It seems too fanciful to have any kind of meaning in, in our day, but the church then would have understood what John was talking about. Modern readers find that understanding Revelation is a really daunting task because of all the imagery and the symbolism and jumping from one scene to another, from things in heaven to things on earth, and it, it gets kind of crazy. But it's because of these things that we really need to avoid the temptation of assigning symbolic meaning where it doesn't belong. There's so many assumptions and interpretations out there. There's a lot of them. And we have to avoid assigning misguided thinking to any of the symbolic messages that are in the book of Revelation. And so we're going to try and, and not assign those anything that's not meant to be. And to help avoid that temptation, it's important that we know the style of the book, what its purpose is, how it was written, so we can gain an understanding of this eternally consequential book. And I say that because how we live out our days as we live out the book of Revelation is going to determine our eternity, how we spend our eternity. So let's get into Revelation. The title, The Revelation of Jesus Christ. Well, the author, really, of Revelation is Jesus. John was the writer, but it was Jesus who dictated information by way of visions and, and encounters with him and telling him, write this to the churches. He dictated it, so he's the author. John was the writer. The revelation of Jesus Christ makes clear that the preeminent figure in the book of Revelation is Christ, the Lamb of God, the King of kings and Lord of lords, whose victory was won through his shed blood on the cross. In fact, if we were to study the whole book, we would see that the whole message of Revelation is all about Jesus triumphing over Satan and bringing salvation's plan to completion. It's first about Christ, but secondly, it's about you and me. You ever thought about that? The book of Revelation is about us. Verses 5 to 8, if we were to carry on reading, they, it reveals the identity more of who Christ is or the one who the testimony is about. And John wanted to bring confidence to the reader right away that this came from Christ. It is secure information. It is true. And you can build your hope because he's the final victor. He reigns in power. The objective of Revelation was to encourage the churches of John's day. He wanted to give them hope. And it's also to teach us in our day. This is a multi-purpose book, helping the, the churches that were struggling then and also helping us to know by way of prophecy the things to come. And it's for us to, to grab a hold of so that we can have confidence in the one that we serve and have hope. The book is a series of parallel groups of things that happen. It, it's not a chronological, historical thing. We think in, in terms of chronology. So this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens. The calendar goes in order. You know, we do this yesterday, and this today, and that tomorrow. But this is not arranged that way. It's arranged in 
chronologically. And so we need to be able to put together some of the things that are happening in not chronological succession. But yet there's still historical development that we will see of the kingdom of God. It's in this book that all other books of the Bible end and meet. In it is the consummation of all previous prophecies. Everything comes to conclusion in the book of Revelation. Daniel foretells as to Christ and the Roman destruction of Jerusalem and the last Antichrist, but John's revelation fills up all the intermediate period and describes the millennium and the final state of the Antichrist. Daniel, as a godly statesman, views the history of God's people in relation to the four world kingdoms. Remember reading that in Daniel? But John, as an apostle, views history from the Christian church aspect. Revelation derives its title from the Greek apocalypsis, which means just an uncovering and unveiling. It's a disclosure of things that are currently unknown or hidden. John records a series of revelations that have been received either through visions, journeys to heaven, or sometimes both. The prophetic record foresees the final fulfillment of salvation history initiated by God immediately after the fall of Adam and Eve. And so forms a, a fitting climax, not just to the New Testament, but to the whole Bible. If you were to read the first two chapters of Genesis and the last two chapters of Revelation, you would see a great comparison. So it kind of bookends the whole, the whole book, the whole Bible the whole time between beginning and end. It's an interesting, an interesting look. It's the conclusion to history that was begun in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve to bring history almost back around to where it started from, in paradise with God. Scripture is a complete whole book. It's books written ranging over a period of, of 1,500 years being mutually connected. Genesis presents before us man and woman living in innocence and having relationship with God, followed by man's fall through Satan's subtlety and man's consequent misery, and then his exclusion from paradise and its tree of life and delightful rivers. And then Revelation presents that in reverse order. Man, first liable to sin and death, but afterwards made conqueror through the blood of the Lamb, the first Adam and Eve is represented by the second Adam, who is Christ, and the church would be his spotless bride in paradise with free access to the tree of life and the crystal water of life that flows from the throne of God. As Genesis foretold the bruising of the serpent's head by the woman's seed, so Revelation declares the final accomplishment of that prediction. Now here's a big word. Eschatology. Eschatology is a theological study concerned with topics and events that are yet in God's future program. In the present day, our ex eschatology is directly concerned with the end of the age. However, if eschatology is concerned with things that are not yet known but are on God's timetable, we would see eschatology happening throughout all of scripture, wouldn't we? We read about Israel and the experience of the exile that was crucial to the development of biblical eschatology. It had promises for the future. What about Abraham and Sarah? They're promised a multitude of descendants and land and prosperity and blessing. It didn't happen right away. It was an eschatological development over time to fulfill God's promises. Similarly, the covenant at Sinai included pledges of deliverance, land, and divine revelation. The blessings of this covenant were conditional. We know Israel found themselves many times in the clutches of adultery and disobedience. They had it good with God, then they lost it. Then they had it good with God because God came along and, and said, okay, it's time, 
And that came through means of some difficult things. So they came back to God, and then over time they lost it. But does that mean that God had abandoned his covenant? No. It still means that there is still a future and a hope. Jeremiah 29, 11. He says, there is a future and a hope still. God has not abandoned the covenant. What about the covenant with David? Also played a significant role in later eschatological expectation. God's promise to David of an everlasting throne contributed to the hope of Israel's renewing following the exile. And it became the basis for the belief in a kingly Messiah who would rule eternally. All of that and more is unfolding from Old Testament through to now. Okay, so Revelation 1, verse 1. This is a revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the events which must soon take place. This message was written to who? The servants of God. Not merely to his servant John, but to all his servants. And that's important. It wasn't meant just to be for the seven churches, but it was meant to be something for us as well today. God entrusted the Apostle John with this book of Revelation to deliver it to the churches as a prediction of the most important events that would happen in history. And it was for their strengthening of their faith and to give their hope some direction. The message relates to the things which are happening in the then church, but it's also the things that will happen describing the future state of the church. The resurrected, glorified Jesus Christ reveals himself to the apostle John who had been imprisoned on the island of Patmos to unveil a spiritual diagnosis for seven of the churches in Asia Minor, which John was familiar with. He would have known those churches. Much of the book of Revelation focuses on events at the end of the age, more so than any other book in history. But it also focuses on practical choices that believers and unbelievers must make in the course of their lives. He uses the word shortly. The apostles thought that Christ was going to return in their lifetime. And because they thought that, that gave them um, the juice that they needed, the excitement that they needed in order to take the gospel to all of where they could reach, all the different other churches. But God's time clock and our time clock are different, aren't they? Many times we see the, the prophesied outcome only after a series of events, maybe several years. Israel's 40-year trek in the wilderness, the promise of the Messiah, it took many years. What about Jesus' statement, behold, I come quickly. A thousand years is like a, and a day is like a. And sometimes it's hard to grasp because we see, as we read through scripture, we see the outcome in a matter of verses or chapters when really it, it took years sometimes for that outcome. Now there are many significant numbers that reveal times and symbols in scripture. God is a God of order. Numerically, there's an order to all of what God does. The book of Revelation centers around the number seven, actually seven sevens. Seven is the biblical number of completion. So let's see how God uses seven to bring completion to things. There's seven days in God's week. There are seven holy feasts for God's nation. There are seven main sections of scripture, Revelation being the seventh. We see the number seven in Joseph's dreams, Naaman's washing, Daniel's vision, among others. Revelation is the completion of the completion, having seven years throughout. Let's look at the book of Revelation. There's seven stars and seven lampstands, which are the seven churches. 
There's a scroll with seven seals, seven trumpets played by seven angels, seven bowls, seven characters with key rolls, the seven dooms, and the seven, uh, and the seventh being the fulfillment of all. Seven is a key number. Now, if a thousand years is like a day, and a day is like a thousand years, what about this? The Old Testament timeline is approximately over 5,000 years. The New Testament timeline from Christ until our present day is about 2,000 years. Now, five plus two is? And so it's probable that this being the seventh year is going to be his completion year of the age. Another place where we see an interesting correlation to this is using another important number in Scripture, which is three. In Exodus, where God tells the people to prepare themselves for a vision from him on Mount Sinai. This is what he says in uh, Exodus 19.10. And the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day, because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. On the morning of the third day there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountains and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Now do you see some of the imagery that is in there that is, is very prevalent in the book of Revelation? You see that? But let's look at this. The similarities. One, uh, on day one and two, consecrate yourself and get ready because on the third day the Lord will come down and everyone will see him. Thunder, lightning, the whole thing. Now if one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day, we have here symbolically two thousand years to prepare and in the third thousandth year, which we are currently living in, the Lord comes down. You see that? We're living in the third thousandth year. Zero to a thousand is the first. One thousand to two thousand is the second. We are now in the third thousandth. And so if we read the word shortly, back to the word shortly, and in the in verse 3 it says for the time is near but for the past 2000 years believers have been having this hope for an expectation of all these things taking place it's really saying these events are imminent they are going to happen and they can take place at any time but when they do start to take place they will begin to take place in rapid succession the entire sequence of last day's events will happen rapidly, like a series of dominoes falling over. And we are starting to see some of those things start to happen. Would you agree with that? Now let's look at verse 3. God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church, and he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says, for the time is near. There's a special blessing for the one who reads the book of Revelation to the church. And there's a special blessing for those who listen to it and obey it. It's the only book that promises blessing for reading and hearing and obeying. The whole Bible is more than one half prophecy. Most of it has been fulfilled. We're waiting now for the prophecies of the book of Revelation to come to pass. And, you know, not everyone sees the importance of Old Testament prophecy. But it's, it's everywhere in the book of Revelation. What does Peter say about that? In 2 Peter 1, 19 to 21, he says this, We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. He's talking about the prophets in the Old Testament. And you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets through human, human, humanity spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. 
So Peter calls the New Testament church to take heed to what the Old Testament prophets were saying. It's not outdated. Revelation 10, 7. Jesus says, but in the last days when the seventh seal is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced it to who? The servants or and the prophets. So all prophecy must harmonize with the whole body of scripture. And as we go through this mini-series, we want to see how the Old Testament and the New Testament flow into the book of Revelation in order to bring some understanding to what it's really saying. And we want to interpret it in light of the whole book. Paul prayed for the church in Ephesus in Ephesians 1, 15, that they would receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that they can know God better. Is that your desire this morning, to know him better? I hope it is. The book of Revelation gives us that opportunity to peek in a little bit further into the identity of who our king is and to know him as the king of all kings. And so we're going to pray that God will give us the ability to go through the book of Revelation, interpret it wisely, and receive the revelation that he wants us to receive. Would you pray with me? Let's stand together. And if that's your prayer, just open your hearts and, and even your posture and just ask the Lord. Father, we just thank you that we have the opportunity and the privilege of studying your word. Thank you that we can know the secrets of the kingdom. You told your, your disciples that. We can know the secrets of the kingdom. And so, God, we just pray that as we go through this study, that you would reveal to us what is on your heart and, and what we need to know for this day. And I pray, God, for wisdom, wisdom to be able to interpret it wisely. And that we would not put our own uh, ideas into anything, but God, that it would be totally spirit-led. Because, because, Father, we want to know. We want to be ready for the things that are coming in our day. And so, Father, we just thank you for what you are doing. Thank you for opening up your scripture to us. And now, Father, I pray that as we go from this place, that, God, you would give us divine appointments, Father, with people who desperately need to know who you are. And that, God, you would open up opportunity for us to share the gospel with them. And so, Father, we just thank you and praise you for all you are doing. In Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. We're going to close with a song. Our God saves. <laughs>